Hello and welcome to What Skills Education is Needed to Fulfill Vision 2030, a roundtable discussion held in partnership between Times Higher Education and Coursera for Campus. My name is Ashton Wenborn and I am the Special Projects Deputy Editor at THE. I'll be chairing today's session. So if you could turn your cameras on for the discussion today, that would be really useful. And if you could also introduce yourselves and your institutions the first time you speak, that also helps out the audience and, and your fellow panelists as well. If you'd like to get my attention or make a point um, at any time in the discussion, then please do feel free to just jump in. Or you can also use the raise hand function, which is just at the bottom of your screen in the reaction section. With the world watching, Saudi Arabia's Vision 2030 programme aims to reach new levels of sustainability that will support and enable both the local and global economy of the future. Delivery of its goals won't be possible without a skilled workforce. But at a time when skills education is also experiencing a transformation, institutions must adapt to meet the changing needs of students, employers and government. So I'd like to begin today's discussion by asking, first of all, how does skills education help produce more employable graduates? Uh, Dr. Connie, perhaps you could start us off today. Okay, thank you so much for that. So the question is, how does skills, uh, skills education basically uh, help the students of today? I think it's extremely important. And one of the things that we do here at Prince Sultan University is try to foster uh, the most recent skills uh, or the, the current skills, the trends in um, the job market in order to help our students become more employable. Uh, and right now, I think with the pandemic and we're coming off the, the, off the, the pandemic mode, I, I think more or less, we're back face to face. But I think it's extremely important that we are incorporating um, digital skills for, for our students, uh, which would include that they have to be familiar with the different video conferencing platforms that are, are out there because when they, when they graduate and they go into the workforce, um, they might be asked to do meetings, conferences, different things that are online. So they need to be familiar with Zoom. Uh, we use Google Meets here at Prince Sultan University. There, and plus all of the other platforms that might be out there. They should have at least the flexibility to be able to do that. So this is one thing that I think is definitely important that should be incorporated into our, our, um, our curricula or our extracurricular activities, if you will. Also being good and effective communicators. This is a extremely important skill to, to have, and this can be displayed in a variety of ways. We can support our students with that inside the curriculum and the courses that we offer, plus the extracurricular uh, clubs that are available on, on campus, whether it's the uh, Prince Sultan University's Model United Nations Society, our Toastmasters clubs, um, and the, the different, uh, uh, different, different opportunities that might arise uh, uh, from the, the society overall. Um, so it, it's not about like saying there's like one specific set of skills. It's about uh, looking at what are the current needs or trends in the workplace and the job market. And then how can we help our students? And it's not about like right now, okay, we can be focusing on right now, but we also have to think five, 10, 15, 20 years from now. So when you're developing your curricula, you need to be advancing the curricula so that it addresses these issues as you, as you move forward. You mentioned the, uh, the Model UN project. And I think that's a really interesting example of the way that sort of cross department um, collaborative project-based learning um, can actually help students from, from any field gain, mm -hmm. gain those employability skills. And actually you can have all sorts of majors, you know, politics, maths, um, English, everyone coming together to um, kind of have a meaningful learning experience. Of so do you think that that sort of learning that perhaps um, moves away from a specific field 
is actually the way forward? I definitely believe interdisciplinary uh, opportunities is uh, extremely important as we move forward. Uh, we can see with the, the field of data sciences, data science isn't like, it's not in one specific area. It, it, it covers a vast array of all of the disciplines, whether it's humanities to engineering to uh, computer science, if you will. Um, so it, it, it is definitely a way to do that. and. Uh, we just had uh, a model United Nations conference uh, on campus uh, this past month, this month, actually a couple of weeks ago. And we had over a hundred delegates uh, from a variety of backgrounds, high school students to university level uh, students that participated in the, uh, in the event. Uh, so it was um, a very interesting uh, way to see because They've had to, during the pandemic, they moved to online. So they were holding the uh, events online. And then this was the first face-to-face uh, -face, uh, uh, conference after the, the pandemic. So it was, it's, it's really a great experience for, for the students and they learn a lot, actually. Mm, absolutely. And Mr. Ayad, I wonder, in your role of Director of Evaluation and Academic Accreditation, how would you suggest is the best way to provide accreditation for those sorts of extracurricular activities, which perhaps are in many ways more valuable to employers than a kind of a degree credential? Do you think that there's a way to work that into accreditation to make sure that students are recognized for taking part in that kind of project-based learning? Um, actually, Mr. Yad is from the Technology Center. Okay. So He's, IT. He's, not going down. He's not going to be able to answer that question. No problem. I mean, I can. the The question I think is relevant to to the rest of the panel, though. Perhaps Heba, I don't know if you can speak on that a bit. Uh, yes, sure. Actually, as uh, what uh, Dr. Mitchell mentioned, the uh, interdisciplinary skills are becoming more and more important every day. And if you are thinking about the futures and the skills that we need to equip our students uh, for the future, I think uh, one of the very important skills is uh, when we talk about, you know, the, the change is happening in a very, very fast pace. And we need to make students uh, be sure to be, that, that, they are, that they can adapt to that change. So if you're talking about extracurricular activities and being involved in several projects outside their comfort zone, outside their regular classes, uh, then this is will, of course, improve their um, resilience skills to, to adapt to, to whatever unexpected uh, factors that might affect their journey, like COVID. Uh, it's, it's amazing how the world actually were, was able to adapt to COVID in, in, in one night and PSU uh, as part of this, of course, in one night we changed everything to online. We adapt to the new norm as they call it. We uh, teachers, students, everyone become you know very eager to learn more about technology, things that we we had before, but probably we did not, yeah, we did not find ourselves, um, uh, uh, we did not find the need or the demand to, to learn it. Uh, but when COVID is here and we are stuck at our homes, we, we needed to take actions. And so that's why we learned uh, to adapt to all these skills. If we're going to talk about accreditation. Now, accreditation, in my opinion, is to recognize that this certain program um, has reached the level of uh, quality that uh, we can trust and we know that it will address all the needs that for the students. So of course, if we're talking about extracurricular activities, and this is actually one of the standards that is mentioned in the national uh, standards for accreditation that we use for the programs in Saudi Arabia, is to what extent we can uh, help our students, expose them, give them the opportunity to be involved in extracurricular activities that can help them, of course, uh, in an in, in indirect way to improve their soft skills, their communication skills, their resili resilience skills, uh, you know, at the time of COVID, PSU came up with this um, uh, call for, uh, for, uh, for proposals for COVID research, COVID-focused research. And there was a, a prize given to the, to the, to the winner. Um, and the goal here is, uh, again, to acknowledge 
uh, the, the and 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 to acknowledge this new uh, pandemic in our life and and to deal with it, uh, we encourage the research from all fields. It can be talking about how students can cope with COVID, how their uh, you know anxiety level can be with COVID. And mm -hmm. it can be also a research where they look at how can education be improved with college? How can we have new technology that can help us educate students while you know uh, at home? So uh, ranging from all uh, disciplines, uh, but again, discussing uh, how COVID affecting our lives. So yes, sure, I, I, we're talking about accreditation. I think it's very, very important to consider all factors, including the um, probably not the very uh, direct factors. Thank you. And we've spoken about universities and institutions adapting to provide the skills that employers are demanding, but it's not a simple task to figure out what employers want graduates to have in terms of skills. And I wonder, Pedro, if um, Coursera has seen any trends in terms of what's in demand, both from employees, but actually from learners themselves who are identifying what is a, is a good skill to acquire. Absolutely. Um, well, I guess that uh, my, my colleagues are absolutely right when um, they assessed the situation as a as a as a change that was brought about by a huge impact, it was a very very um, sudden impact that um, the pandemic um, brought to higher education in general. Just to give a little bit of a sense, um, before COVID nineteen, I guess it was less than a half of higher education faculty that had taught um, an online course. So when the pandemic started, obviously that was the only alternative. Um, everybody had to appeal to online somehow to to be able to continue the learning process um, and i think that obviously this set a trend i think um, many universities today are deploying um, online courses at some level either uh, let's say with a hybrid um, um, approach or um, a more flexible approach where students can just do courses outside and this is the thing that we could maybe discuss in terms of accreditation as well but from our perspective, I would say that um, uh, one of the reasons that um, it's, it is difficult to know what employers want is because a life of a skill is changing really fast. So, you know, when we consider that um, something that you would learn would stay for 20 years now, you know, uh, the, the average life of a skill is probably no, um, let's say, um, more than five years um, yeah. and in some areas i mean it's even even quicker like um probably three to two years so things are changing really fast now what we um try to uh let's say uh, support um when we look into that um landscape is actually to maybe bridge the gap between universities and employers what the job market is in need of, um, what we try to understand is really um, with the training programs that employers are implementing, you know, what is actually that they, they want? What, um, what is it that they're offering? And when we engage with employers out there, we try to make sense. We've been producing loads of different reports in, um, in say different um, areas i think that there are top trending skills like you know um, machine learning obviously artificial intelligence um, uh, especially skills in in the areas of data science and technology um, c programming um, you know the numerical analysis i think that these are some of the things that are trending right now and i guess that the idea is that we can support universities uh, not really by replacing what professors are doing, because I don't believe that uh, anybody would be able to do that. I think that the idea is really to collaborate. So there are um, courses out there that can supplement existing courses at universities. Um, and what we would be able to do through this type of collaboration is to create intelligence that is actually shareable. So. The great thing about um, you know online um, products in a way is that they collect a lot of data, and this data can be analyzed. Um, 
if we can provide that type of intelligence to faculty, to you know, university strategists, I think that um, when they sit to prepare strategic plans, um, I believe that uh, the process of delivering what students need when they go to the job market is going to be a lot more accurate. Thank you, Pedro. And you've just mentioned that process of strategic planning and um, a, a real focus of today's discussion is Vision 2030, which clearly has taken a huge amount of strategic planning and then for institutions to, um, you know, align align the goals of Vision 2030 with their own curricula um, must have must have taken up a, a great deal of your own or your own thought process. So I wonder what that process was like and how institutions are continually adjusting their curricula to make sure that it is moving in the same direction as Vision 2030. Um, Dr. Tahir, I see that you've just meant, uh, just joined us today. Um, would you like to speak to us a little bit about creating curricula that aligns with Vision 2030? Or perhaps Mr. Iyad is, oh, yes, thank no, you. Thank sorry you so to hear it, please. Uh, and thank you so much, Ashton, as well as Lue and Pedro for welcoming me to share my views on your discussion today. First of all, I want to share with you that I, I did overhear your discussion earlier. I was en route to your meeting. And I first want to comment on that when you asked about accreditation, notably uh, Prince Sultan University was one of the first universities in Saudi Arabia to earn the national accreditation. And since then, we have also achieved international accreditation. And as you may know, when it comes to accreditation, accreditation fundamentally means trust. It means that the parents can trust that we're offering a quality education, as well as our employers can trust that we're making sure that our students know what they need to meet the market demands. Overall, our community can trust that we're going to also support them. And one of the aspects I wanna highlight, whether you're talking about our national accreditation or any international accreditation, they usually have a standard related to learning resources. And so if I were to advise whether it was Coursera or any major platform to advise them, that would be most excellent if we could collaborate with the accreditation agencies such that it becomes a best practice that such platforms are used as part of the educational process in higher education and maybe even in other levels of education. Another aspect would be the data. I overheard Mr. Pedro mentioning the data. It would be most excellent if it was the best practice that was recommended to the accreditation agencies for faculty members not only to mention that they utilize Coursera or other platforms as part of the education, but if they actually had to provide the data as key performance indicators. And so when it comes down to your second question, Ms. Ashton, when you mentioned about how universities are strategically planning and keeping up with the Saudi vision to 2030, I can tell you here at Prince Sultan University, we were very excited when the country launched the 2030 vision. It was a, a grand celebration within the country and everyone was really excited about it because it was a new way forward for the country. And what we did as an institution is we immediately made sure that we aligned our strategic plan with the Saudi vision 2030, we integrated significant initiatives from the Ministry of Education, as well as not only the Ministry of Education, but we also try to align with the Sustainable Development Goals, which is espoused, of course, by the Times Higher Education. And so with that, it definitely was a learning curve, but nevertheless, we're really grateful for Times Higher Education, as well as their guidance that they provide through the impact rankings. It truly is a model, not only for the higher education institutions, but as a member of the American Evaluation Association, notably just a few weeks ago, we were discussing the sustainable development goals. And we're doing research right now to see what are people's awareness about those. And so as we try to bring and try to contribute to, if you will, reducing the effect of climate change, it's really excellent for us to go virtual as much as possible, as well as to monitor the quality of education as we make efforts to normalize what has been normalized by the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, Dr. Tahira. And in terms of integrating 
those Vision 2030 goals, but also the sustainable development goals. How do, how can um, researchers, teachers, you know, members of strategic teams, how can they make sure that those, um, those wider goals are reflected in, in the details of curricula? If I may, if, oh, sorry, Tahira, I'll let you speak to that, but I, I think the biggest thing is raising awareness um, among uh, all of the stakeholders, faculty, students, um, the, higher, the higher management, the, the, the administrative staff about what are the SDGs and then how can we be using those? And some of the things we have done within the Teaching and Learning Center at PSU is we have held uh, uh, training sessions about how to implement uh, greening, greening the curricula uh, across all disciplines, you know, so it can be done whether you're teaching a humanities class or a uh, renewable energy, reusable energy uh, course in the College of Engineering, uh, you can still be adapting these concepts into your courses. So it's about raising awareness so that they can understand how it can be incorporated in. Um, uh, we also have student clubs, we have an environmental club. Uh, and they have Go Green campaigns. They work on uh, uh, recycling, getting people to recycle the paper and the, the different pro products on campus. And they work with a recycling company. Uh, so it, again, it goes back to raising awareness and, and helping guide them to see how they can actually be doing it. And if I may add to what Dr. Ali is mentioning, it does require a bit of free association as a psychologist, I can highlight that during my current research where I'm exploring the relationship between virtual external reviews, which was implemented by the majority of accreditation agencies around the world, as well as the sustainable development goals, one of the questions I ask my research is what is the relationship between them? And sometimes some of my participants, they know about them. Other times they don't. And, and I can share with you that sometimes it's just important to ask the question. And we were really appreciative of when the Saudi Vision 2030 came out, our president, Dr. Ahmed Yamani, launched an initiative of awareness and he required our faculty members to make sure that they had some type of project inside of their courses so that students would really understand the initiative. So as you know, when it comes down to project-based learning, sometimes it's one of the best strategies to teach. And so what we had in our class was this, regardless of what which uh, program you had students who were presenting about the Saudi Vision 2030 and how it related to their careers. And I can give you an example within my very own class. I encourage my students in the personal development skills course to highlight how is the Saudi Vision 2030 related to your profession and what is it that you want to contribute to the Saudi Vision 2030. I usually speak to my students, I said, you are our future CEOs, our future ministers, our future scholars. So it's important for you to understand what direction the country is going in. And notably, Prince Tai University is also a very diverse university. We have over 45 uh, fa faculty members from over 45 different nationalities teaching here, as well as a diverse student population. So I encourage our students not only at times to look at our national goals, but even on our regional goals, as well as our global goals. And so it, it definitely is a, a learning curve again for everyone. But nevertheless, as long as we keep on having this important conversation, I think we'll be able to contribute significantly to the sustainable development goals. Thank you, Dr. Tahira. You also mentioned normalizing the technology use that COVID made essential. And I wonder, Mr. Iyad, in your role in the uh, Technology Center, do you find that digital tools are helping institutions or PSU specifically to deliver the skills training that, um, that it intends to? Perhaps Mr. Iyad's not with us right now. Um, but Pedro, sorry, did you want to jump in there? Talking about it, um, I um, have been doing a lot of um, work with universities in Saudi where there is a very interesting collaboration, not only um, with, let's say, a connection to delivery of content that uh, already exists, but I think that one of the most important aspects of this collaboration between, for example, Coursera and universities, um, especially in Saudi, is the desire that exists 
within these universes to foster, um, say, knowledge transfer uh, internally, and that it is led by their own professors. So it is really important to see this, um, let's say, drive, because I believe that one of the um, probably core aspects of the uh, transformation that exists is actually being led by the centers of teaching and learning and centers of excellence of universities. So they're promoting quality, but most importantly, they are promoting upskilling of faculty. So this is um, a very, very important thing to take into consideration when we are organizing strategies like this, that anything that is implemented uh, within the university will have to go through faculty. Um, usually, uh, when we approach collaborations, there is always a little bit of a fear that you know there, there, there will be a conflict of interests between uh, online learning tools and faculty. Um, why? I guess that one of the reasons is because until recently, um, online tools did exactly the same job. Um, they just basically offered um, videos to be watched and um, that was it. Faculty was pretty much feeling um, threatened because it was pretty much a passive, um, um, say, work. But I guess, I guess that today with so much interaction existing between um, tools like that and the opportunity for faculty to develop their own tools and virtual labs changes the game. I think that the idea now is that um, faculty is looking at these resources as a way to improve the process of teaching. And how do they do it? Um, they, they look at it as, um, let's, let's put it like this, the mechanical process of you know, passing information to a learner can be, um, let's say, enhanced by um, deploying an online course. Whereas the discussion process that faculty will have with the students is really the core point of the knowledge, you know, they, uh, the challenge and the debate. And I think that that's the thing that online courses have been um, really supporting uh, faculty uh, in this journey. I believe that, um, you know, that some people call the flipped classroom, um, others are a little bit more interested in the, the, the debate, the discussion um, points. And I think that that's actually a very, very useful tool because it does actually foster um, independent learning from the side of the students and also give faculty a lot more time to maybe dwell on the things that they believe are more important to bring to the classroom. And if can I, I add to that, can I add to uh, what uh, Mr. Pedro has mentioned in terms of this issue about faculty members and, and how, yes, it has to go through faculty members. And I wanna share in my research on motivational experiences, specifically of expatriate faculty members to come to Saudi Arabia and teach. I found there was a lot of research related to faculty members and, and their motivations and student motivations to use technology and trying to address their anxieties uh, regarding any technology, uh, which may at times be new to them is, is truly important. As well as I wanna say, not to assume that all millennials or general X students are just uh, technologically savvy. Some of them have their own anxieties as, a, as I can share with you that every term that I teach, sometimes there's a few students, no, they're, they're not necessarily friends with their computers or they're not necessarily social media savvy. So very small student population might have that, the majority are. But I think it's important to consider the potential of the digital divide, not only in terms of resources, but then also in terms of how people feel about technology. Sometimes we, you know, especially during the COVID-19, I don't know about you, but at times I felt like a text message because we were just texting back and forth. We were, we were on our computers and, and at some point in time, we felt like we were part of it. And so you, you just want to get away from the screen sometimes. And so I think it's very important to holistically balance when we're talking about technology. How many hours are we staring at the screen? You know, we went from having all these guidelines from the psychological field uh, in terms of how much time we should stare at the screen screen and now how many hours just think about it how many hours have you stared at the screen today so so with that uh, there's a lot of advantages but then there's also some disadvantages and we still have to make sure we include the human touch yes. and if i may tag tag on here sorry pedro um i think it's important that we have uh, 
faculty buy-in and uh, which I think it ties in with what Pedro and Tahir were both saying is that you know the the training is extremely important and I can say here at Prince Sultan University between the teaching and learning center and the e-learning center we do spend a lot of time invest a lot of time in, in providing training sessions for our faculty and our students about any of the tech tools that are, that are out there but in addition to that we do caution the faculty uh, to make certain yet you know, there are lots of options now with the pandemic we, we have so many so many options of the different apps that are available that you can be using to support the teaching and learning practices inside your courses. So yes, you might have synchronous classrooms, the face-to-face -face classrooms, hybrid classrooms, but there's also the asynchronous. Asynchronous has become a part of all our educational practices right now. So it's about how can you use those tools effectively? And then how can you choose the right tools? that are going to support at the end of the day, the, the outcomes, the learning outcomes that you want your students to achieve by the time they finish a course, by the time they finish their, their program and, and they go out into the, the workforce or they continue their education. So these are all of the things that we have to take into to consideration. And uh, definitely training is, is, is a vital role in that. Um, and it, Pedro, if I can chime in here, we have done a, a pilot with Coursera in the past academic year. It's successful. We still have faculty using uh, uh, Coursera in some of their, their courses. They're definitely uh, using the uh, guided projects uh, to reinforce the different skills that they think their students need inside their, their courses. And, and I think that is something that we definitely need to get used to having the adaptive learning tools. I think this is a great uh, a great way to go as well, uh, especially for you know the students coming from high school into university, being able to provide them with uh, with uh, uh, something that they can you know develop their skills, maybe their language abilities or their math skills if need be, but having those adaptive learning tools will give them the independence to be working on the specific skills they need for their academic programs uh, and, and uh, uh, facilitate their learning process. Uh, if I may uh, jump here also into discussion, I wanna go back to uh, talking about the normalization of the, you know, the the use of the, the, all these digital tools. And if there is one thing we can take as benefit from COVID, from this pandemic, is actually being able to deal with all these new tools as a normal thing. Yeah. It's actually uh, very, very nice to see how teachers, educators, uh, are trying to enhance, as what Pedro said, enhance the education mm -hmm. by, using, uh, by uh, using these tools. Only last night, my, my uh, son at 10.30 p.m., he was telling me that he has a meeting with his teacher 10.30 p.m. Of course, the meeting was online because teachers are so used now to the, you know, the, the, the online uh, communication with the students and students are used to that. It's easy to facilitate, uh, you know, a session, a tutoring session uh, late at night because it's probably not very convenient for everyone to come at the university at that time, right? But having it at home, wherever it's convenient for everyone and it's a tutoring session, then again, here you can see how this teacher was able to use his experience from the pandemic to, although his, his class is now is, is on campus, but uh, he's using these online tools to meet more with the students more often and probably in a more uh, convenient uh, way uh, and to help them tutor them or answer their questions. So, and um, going from that to using Kahoot, many of us use Kahoot during teaching uh, when we're doing online. I guess what, teachers are still using Kahoot now in their classroom, the regular classroom, they ask, they open Kahoot and they ask students to, to take their phone and, and use it because they can see how that tool, uh, especially if we're talking about math classes, which is what I teach, where students sometimes get bored, you know, it's, it's a rigid uh, subject a little bit. So using such tool will make them excited about, uh, you know, all the balloons that will come down if someone's winning and to see who's uh, answering and who's uh, getting the right answer or not. So this is really 
really nice to see how educators are coming out of this uh pandemic but with you know with with, with some uh benefits to that thank you heba i wanted to return to your point about um the way the asynchronous learning can well allow your son to have a tutoring session at, at half 10 in the evening but actually i think that flexibility of of learning can be really valuable for widening participation and access. And we've also spoken a little bit about the digital divide. And for people with care responsibilities, working, you know, all sorts of things, people have different lives, then, then asynchronous learning is actually really valuable. But then at the same time, there's a need to consider the fact that for a lot of people, access to digital devices, the internet, a space to, to, to work and learn from home is also a struggle. Mm. So how can institutions identify the students that are really benefiting from um, online learning and the students who are perhaps being um, challenged more by that? And how, and how do the institutions also support those students? Connie, perhaps, is that something that you've been considering? Um, uh, yes, because I, I mean, you're talking about all students and those who might have challenges, but I'm thinking about the students with, uh, with learning needs and uh, how can we use the, the online component to, to support our students with learning needs. I, I think it can, it can help tremendously uh, because some students are quite shy to come forward. So you can have all kinds of like online tools to help them. The, the first thing that I was talking about, the adaptive learning tool. Uh, this is really great for those who are struggling maybe with their language uh, performance. Uh, it, it can definitely help. You can also have online writing tutoring sessions at the math as uh, Dr. Hibble was mentioning. Uh, so I think it can really facilitate. Now, how can you recognize if you're in an online environment, if somebody is, is struggling. I think as an educator, you can tell whether you're in an online environment or in a face-to-face -face situation, which students are struggling, which students are having a hard time grasping the different concepts that you, uh, you want them to, to learn by the time they finish the, the course. Uh, you can look at their results on the different activities you're doing in class, how they respond inside the course, whether it's online in a discussion or a forum or situation, because uh, you can be monitoring and tracking their, their performance uh, in the online arena. If it's in class, of course, you can see, uh, yes, we're wearing masks, but you, 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 I'm learning how to read eyes more <laughs> just to understand. <laughs> To understand, you know, what the students are thinking, how they're feeling, if they're sleepy, if they're, you know, it's all of these things. So this, the, the, the pandemic has got brought a lot of a lot of disturbance to our lives, but at the same time, it has brought lots of afforded us lots of new opportunities that are positives, and we need to learn from it and grow forward. I, I think it has really uh, changed the paradigm of, of education in general, and especially in higher education. We have advanced uh, like 10, 15 years into the future, if you will, as far as incorporating tech into our, uh, into our curricula. So it, it, it's not like we weren't using technology before, but it was, it was more simplistic. Now it has become a bit uh, more complex and we're, we're curious to know which tool is actually going to be more effective to support what I need to do for uh, whether it's a language course or a math course, or as uh, Dr. Tahra was saying, uh, uh, a personal development skill course, what tool is going to help me effectively support my students in uh, achieving the, the course uh, outcomes? I hope I answered your question. If I, may, if I may add to that, thank you so much, Dr. Alia, for reminding me of our experience. If I could just share, uh, given that Prince Hotel University, we were already using blended learning before the pandemic. We made a rapid transition uh, within 48 hours, uh, almost 100% of our courses were online during the pandemic. 
And thereafter, we saw the excellence of our ministry address the very issue you brought up, Ashton, in terms of making sure that it was beneficial and working well. Our Ministry of Education and Kingdom of Saudi Arabia required us to do weekly surveys. So we had weekly surveys that were being done uh, across our universities, and we had to submit reports about that every single week uh, during the first few months of the pandemic. Uh, we already had also our own internal quality assurance, the excellence of our leadership of quality assurance was also monitoring internally what was happening. And then that allowed a, a strong collaboration between our higher management, all of the academic leaders, as well as our information technology center and addressing and doing troubleshooting as those issues came up. Last but not least, we do have our own annual surveys and we try to dialogue with the students within our classes to see what's best working for them. But moreover, the most effective way uh, to really see how online education or online courses might be helpful is through research, using research-based evidence. And I know we, are, we have an educational research lab that just had a really excellent conference here and really trying to utilize the best practices from research. As I've seen some of the research in the past five years, we have some who are using different platforms. And what the teachers will do is look at the students who have courses that are utilizing such platforms compared to the students who are in courses that are not using those platforms. And looking at the outcomes of your students, do they actually perform better? Do they get better grades uh, overall? And so I think it's important to consider some of those strategies, again, from research, and, and then utilizing some of the recommendations we get from improving the quality of education from the sustainable development goals. Thank you. I think another potential positive outcome of the pandemic has been that it's encouraged people and institutions to think beyond physical um, boundaries and borders so we can have this conversation across different continents and teaching can also take place in that way and it's really allowed institutions and learners to develop a more international mindset and I know that that global approach to work and learning and the economy is something that's important for Vision 2030 as well so I wonder how how institutions are adapting to a more global international approach to teaching, learning, skills training. Uh, Dr. Connie, I don't know if that resonates with you. It definitely does. <laughs> um, I think it's something that's extremely important. Right now at PSU and actually for the past six, seven years, I'm a principal fellow of the Higher Education Academy and we do offer a uh, a certificate program for our faculty, training them in higher education and teaching and learning skills. And we encourage them to go ahead and apply for a fellowship with the Higher Education Academy in the UK. Um, we have over a hundred fellows already at, uh, among our faculty members. So I, I think this uh, helps uh, ensure the quality and everybody to raise awareness of the trends in teaching and learning and uh, where we're at where we need to be going. Uh, we also have an institutional learning and teaching committee. We have, uh, we, where we discuss issues that are relevant for, for, for learning and teaching. Uh, and of course, as the director of the teaching and learning center, um, I, I'm chair of this committee and, and we raise issues about uh, teaching and learning. We also have the e-learning center. We have a, another committee that is dealing with online education. I'm also uh, on this committee as well. So we're trying our best to uh, address all of the concerns and, and issues that, uh, that exist so that we are prepared. And it, it's no longer about right here in Riyadh. Uh, we can't be thinking like this when we are uh, thinking about uh, education and employment. Employment is no longer about what's right here. It's about what's uh, inside the country, it's about what's inside the region, and it's about what's across the globe. So uh, having the Model United Nations is a, a prime example of how PSU is, is educating our, our students about uh, global concerns. Uh, I think this this truly uh, 
uh, shows our commitment in, in, in doing so. We also have a, um, an agreement and a partnership with, um, uh, <coughs> sorry, with uh, Fullbridge and uh, students that are accepted into the program, they go through an intensive three to four week uh, program so that they are prepared uh, uh, for this. And it's not just for folks from CBA, the College of Business and Administration, it's also for, for students from all of the disciplines and they try to encourage everyone, even the College of Humanities and, and Sciences. I have my students enrolling in the Fulbright program and so they're able to benefit uh, from the training about accounting and uh, financial uh, concerns uh, that they take within the, the Fulbright program. And it, it just prepares you for the real world once you uh, get out of uni university. Um, I and hope if I, that if I may add uh, here, actually also at Prince Sultan University, we have the International uh, Students Office, which is uh, we, we focus on providing opportunity for students to, 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 uh, to take classes outside the issue internationally. So we have several um, uh, arrangements with several universities where we send students either semester abroad or uh, probably a year abroad. This stopped a little bit last year due to you know, the COVID restrictions, uh, but uh, this actually, uh, this January, students are going also from PSU to study uh, abroad uh, on PSU expenses, by the way. So we try to support them um, to, you know, again, to be exposed to the environment and the world and to see how other universities, are, you know, the experience at other universities. This is, of course, an opportunity for everyone, but there are certain criteria, of course, to meet, you know, to, to know that they are ready uh, for that because not everyone can, you know, just leave country and, and go abroad and study one semester and one year. Um, this might be challenging for some. Mm -hmm. And another thing that I also want to emphasize on is that PSU environment itself, I mean, we have uh, probably, it, if I'm not mistaken, 37 different nationalities for faculty members coming from all over the world. And we emphasize on that and we were actually uh, proud of this, that we have teachers coming, both genders, of course, coming from all over the world. And so students, when they are learning, although they are learning a certain, uh, you know, topics or subjects from that teacher, they also, you know, the, the culture and the, the, the way of uh, the teacher educate their students, this is all different from one place to another. Even the accent is different, of course. And so it's, it's really good to see how students are exposed to all this. They are not, you know, uh, learning within uh, certain limits of culture or language. Thank you, Dr. Haba. And uh, Dr. Connie, you also, you said employment's no longer about what's right here in terms of location, but actually it's also no longer about what's right now. And we're seeing an increase in lifelong learning, upskilling and reskilling throughout, you know, long, long beyond graduation. And really, that's what's going to allow students or, or graduates by that point to continue to fulfill the role that their employers and also something like Vision 2030 requires. So how do institutions and platforms like Coursera support a lifelong approach to learning that doesn't just stop after, after the graduation ceremony? Pedro, I think it would be great to hear from you in terms of Coursera's approach to that. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, specifically about Saudi, um, obviously there is a very, very big, um, say, wave of investment in innovation um, in Saudi Arabia that obviously is, is led by Vision 2030 and projects like Project Headquarters. So there is more and more interest um, of um, international firms to establish offices in, in Saudi and, and do business and this put it puts a lot of pressure on universities because they are the ones that are actually preparing the graduates to take these jobs. At the same time, what you see, there is a little bit of a, a gap uh, when it comes to skills delivery. Um, what we're trying to do here is to work with these universities assessing, you know, the intelligence that we have through reports like the ones we um, publish every year, like um, global skills reports, where we can um, 
guide universities to point out what are the trending skills and work with them to say, um, provide support to future proof that curriculum. So I think that, that that's really the idea. Um, this is changing constantly. Um, so very recently, the um, Saudi government launched another program within the vision that is actually called the Human Capability Program. So this Human Capability Program has 16 objectives, um, many of which are related to the improvement um, of, say, um, education, professional development. So once again, this is directly connected to universities. I think that this is the this is the atmosphere that we feel right now that universities are under a lot of pressure to deliver, um, considering the uh, in well the innovative approach that the the government has put in place. So our our say role as a collaborator in this process is to um, help universities strategize implementing you know tactics to to deliver those skills. Uh, associated with jobs, because we do have a very good knowledge um, for the fact that we actually work with a very, very large amount of companies. So we are doing this already with um, um, universities in Saudi. And uh, I mean, I, I'm quite um, actually happy that Dr. Tom, Dr. Connie brought this up because we did have a very successful pilot at Prince Sultan University as well, which was aiming exactly at supporting their colleges. So it was a very interesting, um, say, collaboration where each college was responsible for making selections of courses that would support um, existing subjects that were taught. And I think that gives a little bit of an idea on how you know uh, we, we we partner with universities and 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 help them delivering those skills. Thank you, Pedro. And Dr. Tahira, did you want to share a little bit about PSU's approach to lifelong learning? Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity again, Ashton. When it comes down to lifelong learning at Prince Sultan University, another exemplary example of that is how we have an education for employment program, which is facilitated by our community service and continuing education program. This program was birthed out of our higher management's passion for making sure that Saudis, if you will, contribute to decreasing the unemployment of Saudi Arabia. The acronym for it is E4E. And notably, when it comes down to this E4E program, there's a variety of academies that are partnerships with major companies to make sure for that once our participants come to this particular program, even though they might have graduated from the university, they might be unemployed. And so, for example, we have a Cisco Academy. And what's unique and amazing about this program is that our participants, when they join the academy, they actually already have a guaranteed job. All they have to do is go through the program, and the program is free. It's part of the community service, institutional community service offered by Prince Sultan University. Although we have, uh, with our students, uh, over a 90% employability rate, there are some students perhaps that benefit from PSU from this program, but it, it, I can just share with you from seeing students come from around the country to come to this program. It's, it's, very, uh, it's, it's very passionate work that's done by the university. And so not only do we have it for our students, or even students from other universities, but more importantly, we have major contracts with the military where we employ skills in increasing their English language as well as computer literacy. And so we have a variety of programs that's offered, uh, not only at Prince Sultan University, but this particular program is unique to Prince Sultan. So when it comes down to lifelong learning, I can tell you as a faculty member and one who teaches our students uh, a variety of courses, we often encourage our students that very important for them to learn from, uh, if you will, continuously throughout their life, that even after they graduate, they should make sure that they continue to upskill and reskill, as you said, and make sure that they participate in professional development associations. Notably, we have a variety of professional development, as professional associations here at PSU. We have everything from, if I may say, as the founder of Toastmasters uh, at PSU, we have Toastmasters International, we also have IEEE and several professional associations for each one of our fields. 
And that's something that was part of our, our strategic plan is to make sure that students understand that once they get their degrees, they should continue, make sure they stay up, uh, keep up with the latest research, as well as continue to make sure that they fill in any gaps that they might have experienced as this industry is rapidly changing so they can be prepared for the Industrial Revolution 4.0. And notably, I just want to also add that we have moot courts. And so not only is the theory that we teach in our courses very important, but it's also important for us to make sure that our students get the practical experience. So whether it's through our moot courts for our law students participating in competitions, uh, which really definitely integrates some of the latest skills and technology. I can tell you we have a cybersecurity club here and they have to integrate and do programming with some of the latest technology here, as well as with our business. We have a Bloomberg lab. And so we have a variety of examples of technologies and skills, uh, presentation skills, et cetera, that are so important, not only for our, our students, but even for our employees. We have professional development. Uh, workshops and, and, and Dr. Ali could speak to that more so than I could to make sure that our whole academic community uh, uh, continues to learn. And, and last but not least, in conclusion, Prince Hotel University is definitely a, a learning community. And not only that, we're dedicated to organizational learning and we have a higher management. And thank you for the presence of Dr. Fibba and her excellency and encouraging any faculty members, students, staff that have any gaps in their knowledge and understanding. Our higher management is very generous in making sure that we rise to the occasion and we hope to continue our partnership also uh, with all our support that we're getting from Coursera as well as from time to higher education. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tahira. That actually brings us perfectly to the end of today's session. So I'd like to thank all of our panelists again for joining us today, sharing your insights and your experiences with us and uh, our, our audience as well. We certainly hope to speak with you again soon, so please do keep in touch. An on-demand video of today's session and a summary article will be available, so if you did want to revisit anything from today's discussion, then I would certainly encourage you to do that. But for now, I would just say again, thank you very much for joining us and goodbye. <laughs>